Hi. 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 Okay. That's how much I can jump around. So I'm Swizzets, and last week I pissed off half the internet by saying that if something takes 10 lines of jQuery, it takes 140 lines of React and Flux. <laughs> uh, okay, it wasn't exactly half the internet. Like 10,000 people didn't even make front page on Hacker News, but it's true, right? It takes so much work to get a modern web app working. You need like Webpack and build systems and transpilers from ECMAScript 6 to ECMAScript 5 and a bunch of other things that just take a lot of time. So we're going to assume all of that is already done for us and we're not gonna care. Today, we're gonna talk about how making modern web visualiza data visualizations is the same as making video games, which is why I made Space Invaders just for this conference. Now, before we begin, who here has built a, we a web data visualization before? Nice, many hands. Who has used D3JS to do that? Perfect. And how many of you have played with React before? Wow, all the same hands, that's interesting. Um, so before we had D3JS, we had spreadsheets. And making data visualizations in spreadsheets is a pain in the ass. It's quick to slap something together, like if you have 10 data points, you can quickly make a bar chart or a pie chart or whatever, and you can take a screenshot and put it on your blog or give it to your client or whatever. And then next week you have another data point and you have to redo the whole process. And then two weeks later somebody comes and says, hey, I wanna take a different look at that data and you're like, fuck, I have to do everything again. And it doesn't scale. It's quick and it's, it, spreadsheets are to, to web visualizations pretty much what jQuery is to making web apps. You can s slap something quick together but it doesn't scale and you can't build on it. So that's a wash. And another, another simple way to do it is using one of the millions of libraries that exist out there. You can use a quick library, give it some data, after you've spent a while getting that data into just the perfect kind of format for that particular library, and it spits out maybe a, a simple chart um, of many kinds. There are many different charts. And now you have something that kind of scales. You can give it thousands of pieces of data and you can put it online and whenever somebody wants to look at your stuff, they just go click on a link, see the thing and you're happy. And it took you what, maybe two, two or three hours to build, like half an hour to an hour to make a simple version that just spit out a, spat out a graph and then another three hours to figure out how to customize the damn thing so it shows your colors and looks and like basically it takes a long time to customize all those libraries because everybody build them for themselves. It's perfect for one use case and if you want anything fancier, if you wanna make your designer happy with branding or your UX guy happy with a uh, nice comprehensive user experience, it's gonna take a lot of time. So what do you do? You go to D D3JS. It's basically what all those libraries are built upon because it is pretty much the most powerful visualization library we have right now. It's the only thing you can use to make those fancy data visualizations that you can see on like New York Times or Guardian or all those fancy newspapers where they have a whole team of people working to build one data visualization that they launch, a million people see, and they can never use it again. It's made for one specific story, for one specific data, and it does that perfectly. It's amazing, it's really cool, and the, um, uh, the guy who built this actually works for the New York Times. So let's look at an example. This, this is a GIF, and GIFs work in presentations, but they get stretched. Um, it's a very simple visualization built by some guy whose name I can't remember right now. Let me see, I can look it up. So it's one of the, exp one of the examples on D3JS's homepage. It's a starburst chart built with a, a D3 layout that shows you, ideally it shows you how people go through a website. You can scroll, scroll over the thing and you get breadcrumbs. Uh, by the way, who knows what D3 layouts are? All right, real quick. 
D3 layouts are what D3.js uses to make reusable data visualization. They don't actually draw anything, but they give you the data specific for drawing things. So ideally, you would take a data set with the kind of data that you care about, throw it into a layout, and out of it would come X and Y positions and sh shape diagram, uh, not shape diagrams, paths for SVG and everything you need to then just say, draw this. And it gets drawn and it works. So how many lines of code do you think it took the guy to build this? It took 300 lines of code to do something that is built into D3.js. Now, most of it is because of the inter interactivity and the, uh, and the breadcrumbs, but this is the core of that visualization. Who, who can tell at a glance what this actually does? Right? It looks kind of like magic. Basically what happens here is, in the first line, some, the guy selects, gets the data, uh, selects all paths, all SVG paths on the drawing board, adds data, binds data to them, and then calls something, something that's called enter, and f then appends a path for every datum with a bunch of custom defined attributes and styles, and there's even an event callback for mouse over at the bottom. Um, and this is basically where D3.js becomes a problem. It was built by somebody who has a, doc a PhD in computer science. So it's really simple, it's very elegant, the code you build with it is going to look great, it's gonna be sleek and fancy and awesome, and then a month later you look at it and you will have no idea what it does. Um, either you will get so much better that the way you used to write D3 a month ago just looks outdated and like crap, or, which is more likely, you haven't touched D3 since then, and you forgot how everything works. And believe me, I've built books on it. I've written books on this stuff. It's much harder than it looks. Um, so what's, other than being, uh, being built by, a, by somebody with a PhD, what's another problem? The problem with, that I kind of touched upon is the enter, update, exit uh, lifecycle of D3 visualizations. For every data, you have something that came onto the scene and is new, and that's, that comes with the enter callback. You have something that's different than it was before, and that's the update, and you have something that was removed, and that's exit. So you have to take care of state. That's the big problem. You're dealing with the state of your data visualization, and for every time you add new data, you have to think about, okay, some of this data is new, some of this data need, has been removed, and some of this data needs to be changed. And that becomes a big problem because you have to manually think about it. You have to keep thinking about it. Ideally, you would just write the transformations once and then just keep updating the data, but it's still a problem. F to update something, you have to calculate how it's changed from before, how to transition between the two states and all the other things, and then you have to be really careful about removing stuff and so on. And it's fine for a while until you get into highly dynamic visualizations with tens of thousands of data sets, uh, tens of thousands of data points, where not only it becomes slow to recalculate all of that every time, but it also becomes just a huge pain in the ass. And I, I'll tell you later about how I solved that once, only once, and then I said, nev I'm never doing this again. Um, but let's take, Oh, I had a summary slide. Um, so, what basic problem? Spreadsheets don't scale. They're quick and easy, but they don't scale. Simple libs you can't customize, and D3.js is very hard to use and has trouble with state. So, who else has this problem? Who else deals with massive data visualizations that users interact with? Video games. A video game, I don't know if you realize it, is just a data visualization. They have a tree with data that stores positions for all the elements you see on the screen. It has like player state and enemy state and all the other things. And then the actual interface that you see is just a data visualization of the internal, of the internal game state. So 
the solution that they came up with is whenever your data, data changes, just throw the whole screen away and draw it fresh. And you, yes, you might remember a talk from Brett Victor from about three years ago. Hands up, who's seen this talk? Yeah. Um, he shows a really cool editor for video games where you can see he has a slider where he can dynamically change time in the, in the game and then also change parameters to make the character move differently. And the magic of this approach is that every frame has become just a function of time. You're no longer dealing with state. You're no longer trying to figure out how to change from one frame to another frame. You're, you can just draw it because time is just a parameter and everything else is just game state. So that's basically what we can do. We can turn our entire data visualization, every single frame of it, every interaction into a function of, of data. Uh, so who has, so uh, one more point I had, to, I had to mention. Why does this work? Like you would think that redrawing everything for every frame would take a lot of time. It would be painful and cumbersome. But in reality, it works better than recalculating all the vectors and making sure that you're moving things correctly because of some f of fancy algorithms that games use, which I don't know if there's a buzzword for them, but the algorithms use, they're basically diffing algorithms where you take two trees of game state, you compare them, and you can see exactly which, which nodes are different than they were in the previous frame. And once you can do that, you only have to redraw those. So instead of every time figuring out uh, how to move what's changed, you just throw away the parts that have changed and, uh, and just redraw them in their new location. Uh, and I now realize that it would, be, it would have been really great if I drew some charts for this, but you're just gonna have to deal with the hand waving. Um, so React is the library that's implemented this, these different algorithms for the web. Their co core principle is we have this fancy algorithm so that you never have to worry about state anymore. You make your components, you change their data, and we're just gonna call render on the components again. And it turns out that it, it, turns out that it really works pretty well. Um, because many of you raised your hand that you already know React, I'm gonna go through the core principles pretty quickly. But one of the main principles of React is that it forces us to use components. It, a component is ideally a self-contained widget or a something that, that just does one thing. It either draws a button or an input field or a space invader or a part of your data visualization, but the point is it only does one thing. If you have to use the word end to describe what your component does, you're putting too many things in there. Now, sure, components can have, nest, can have other components nested, and they can, do, they can be built into very complicated things, but the core component, the bottom of the tree, just does just one thing, and it lets you, and it also does interactions with the user, but that comes later. One of the core, pr another core principle is immutability or statelessness. I'm never really sure which is the better term, but this is where we get the assurance that components are self-contained. Because a component only relies on the parameters you give it, it's going to always render the same thing if you give it the same, the same parameters. No matter where you put it on your page, no matter how many times it's been called, no matter no, basically, no matter what, it will always give you exactly what you expect, which is awesome. And uh, I think in functional programming circles, they call that referential transparency, something like that. Yeah, nods, perfect. Um, and because we can rely on the self-containedness and the immutability, we get the just re-render it part. Because if a component only relies on its inputs, to produce its output, 
That means that if the input changes, you can just say, well, throw it away and draw it again, and you will always get the correct thing. If you got the wrong thing, you can just change data again, and you will get the previous state. Um, so that's what we're going to use for our data visualizations. Because we have components, yeah, because we have components, we can chunk our huge data, huge visualization with a lot of different moving parts into small components that are easier to reason about. Because ideally, or in theory at least, you could give each part of your visualization to somebody else to develop, and when you put them together, it should work. And because we have immutability and the just redrawing, we'll never have to care about how, our, uh, about how to transition between one state and another. We can just let React deal with that. And that means that we have to, instead of caring about changing the view, we have to care about changing the data. And that's where Flux comes in. Who, who has played with Flux before? Awesome, less hands. So, Flux is, uh, is not so much a library or a, a technology as, like React is. It's more of a, what would you say, architecture. It's, a, it's an architecture principle for developing that is particularly well suited for using React. Now, you, do, you can use React without using Flux, but you, it would be very foolish to use Flux without React. Um, and the core principle of Flux is that you have this unidirectional data flow. The, I stole this chart straight from Facebook's uh, documentation on Flux, and um, it explains how the data flows in your app. You, when a user does something, like click a button, you just tell everybody in the app, hey, something happened. And then the dispatcher's like, okay, something happened. I better tell all the data stores. And the data stores are where you hold all of your state, so you don't put it into your components. You just have it in one big, like it's like a giant object, you could say, that has uh, data and then a bunch of like getters and setters to help you deal with that, to help you manipulate the data. And the store listens for events that the dispatcher sends, and it's like, oh, like the player moved, I better change the player's position. Or, oh, a space invader shot, I better make a new bullet and move it around. And that's basically what the store does. It just, it only cares about the data. It doesn't care about how the data is rendered, it just has the data and it changes it when user actions happen. And then you have views, which are React components that listen to change events on the store and they're like, oh hey, data change, I better just re-render myself. And that's pretty much all that the views do. They render when the data changes and they listen for click and button and whatever events from users. Um, anyone, like, am I at least sort of making myself clear here? Nice, many nods, perfect. Mm. So how close are we to Brett Victor's vision of making that kind of stuff? Well, it turns out that for, if you wanna make data visualizations right now, we're actually pretty close. Um, I built this Space Invaders demo, demo with React and D3JS, and what you probably don't realize is that it's really just made out of two different components. You have a rectangle for the player and two scatter plots for the bullets and the Space Invaders. Um, they look different because they have different data, but they're both un they both use the same underlying component. Now, because I didn't, for whatever reason, mostly because I procrastinated, didn't, didn't record GIFs of everything that I wanna show you, I'm just gonna show you a live demo. And obviously, because it's a live demo at a presentation, something's gonna go wrong, but I really think that you should see what I'm trying to show you if you wanna really understand it. Let's see. Okay, where's my Emacs? Does anyone still use Emacs? One hand, wow. <laughs> I like Emacs. Um, it's got fancy features. Anyway, so the way this game is built is this is all the HTML. 
It doesn't do much, it just loads Bootstrap. You can see that part. Yeah, is that better? Anyway, that's not the main point. You don't need much HTML because everything happens in React. So let me show you how the game works. You start the game and you can't see your player and then you die. Um, you start the game again and you can drag the player around and if you use space, you can shoot. And one of the problems is that if you move up too quickly, you can run into your own bullets. And also the, the space invaders shoot a lot. Anyway, uh, you can play this game online, uh, but the point is, um, I, let me show you the main component for this game. Huh. Well, there's one problem with Emacs. I can't see what I'm opening. I'm sorry, I really was expecting this to go better. Um, okay. So here's the basic component for the game. It does, mm, how should we start? Okay, let's see. The component where you're actually playing the game is the interesting part. And that's this. See? If you look at this a month from now, you'll still have some idea of how the app is structured. You see that it's, it goes into an SVG element because who would have thought you can use React not just to build HTML, it can build SVG as well. And I'm pretty sure it could build anything that looks like XML, which is pretty cool. Although, please don't use XML. Um, okay, scroll works weird when you zoom. Anyway, uh, the, the game is built from enemies, bullets, and the player. And because you have this nice componentized structure, you will always be able to tell what's going on. Like, if you remember the enter, exit, blah, blah, blah from the Starburst example that I showed you earlier, I had to look at that for like five minutes before I figured out what it does. This, at least to me, feels a lot simpler. You know that, you just know that you need three different components. And then for the player, <coughs> uh, this is all that the component does, really. It renders an, a rectangle and it, it, gets, it gets its width and height and everything else from, from the properties. This props is, where, is how React tells components which data they have and what they should do. And that's all there is to it. Now, you can use D3's fancy behaviors. Uh, who knows what D3 behaviors are? Okay, a few hands. So D3, other than having layouts for usability, it also has behaviors for what is essentially reusable um, reusable user interactions. What the drag behavior does is it binds a bunch of a bunch of event listeners to your element for like click, drag, touch, tap, things like that, and then just gives you a single event callback called drag. And if you want to use, because D3 needs a reference to the actual HTML node, you have to do that after your component has been mounted onto the screen because React uses something that's called Shadow DOM and it's very complicated and fancy and I'm sure a lot of people at this conference are gonna tell you more about that. But basically, until your component is actually on the screen, React can use it and React can reason about it, but libraries like jQuery and D3 and things like that have no idea what's going on. So you have to wait for the callback that you are actually on the screen and then you can find your node and do D3 stuff on it. Um, and this is all that happens when the player moves. We're not figuring out how to move the player when the drag event occurs. We're not figuring out where the player is. We just say, hey, the player moved, this is the new position. A um, actually, we tell you the delta X and the delta Y, and that's it. And, I'm and then the store, and then when you go into actions, 
actions are like a global, um, it's like your own library for functions. It makes it slightly easier to write the code, but it doesn't do much. If we find the player move, let's see, player move, all it does is it takes the two parameters, the delta x and delta y, tells the dispatcher, hey, the player moved, and this is by how, by how much they moved. Now, because I was trying to be fancy, I have different, different actions for if you move with your key, with a key or if you move with a mouse, but that, that part is kind of irrelevant. I was, making, I was doing an experiment with like easing how the player moves and how it accelerates, but it turns out that's almost impossible to play with. Mm. And when the dispatcher says, hey, the player moved, then I need to zoom out again. When the player moves, <coughs> did I zoom in enough? Can everyone see? All right. Uh, when the player moves, the, the story is like, hey, a dispatcher told me that the player moved. And what it does is it calls its own function with move player. And when that is called, there we go. Now, there's a bunch of fancy like collision detection there with the edges. You can see if you are below the edge or above the edge, then stop moving, which is super fancy. Um, but basically, this, this is the main part. It says, player, you just change your X and Y, and that's it. It doesn't do anything else. It, just, it really just changes the X and Y positions of the player, and then emits a change event saying, hey, the data changed. And the, the Space Invader component then tells, hey, the data changed, updates its own internal state, and then reacts like, hey, your internal state is updated. We're just gonna re-render everything. Figures out that the player has been re the player data has changed, renders the, new, renders the new player, and it just magically appears on a new position. And the cool part about that is even though we aren't recalculating anything here, we still get smooth movement. Even though we're re-rendering the, play, the player rectangle every time in a new position, the user doesn't really notice. It just looks smooth and like the player is attached to your mouse, which I think is pretty cool. Ah, I shouldn't play games. Um, it's, it's, surprisingly, it's surprising how quickly you can fall into something as simple as a few circles in a rectangle. Um, but I promise, so that's how you can deal with data state and data changes and how you can figure out things moving and, and so on. But let me show you how uh, like reusability, I promised reusability, didn't I? So if you look at bullets and if you look at enemies, This is what it takes to render the bullets. You call the points component and give it a bunch of data sets. Now, the only, reason, the only reason that I'm not directly rendering the points component, is, oh, there are actually two reasons. First is, if I directly render the points component in the main Space Invader component, then a month from now, I wouldn't be able to tell that one of, one of the points are bullets and one of the points are enemies. So it's basically just giving them fancy names. Another is that they do have a bit of custom data. So when the bullets come in as just a set of, an array basically of X and Y positions, I, I give them some metadata like making them red, changing their opacity and things like that. And when you look at the enemies, it's pretty much the same. It just renders the points component, and it gives it sli slightly different um, data. Instead of, basically it just has to change the radius, and then the points do the rest. Of course, I'm kinda cheating here because space invaders usually aren't circles, but I think it works well enough. Oh, and just to be fancy, we're also filtering all the dead aliens out of the picture. Now. If you look at the points component, 
that is a bit more complicated. It has to loop through the points and draw a point for every, for every data point. Now, this and the, right, and every point is just an SVG circle with a bunch of metadata. Now, you could of course do this with normal D3JS and it wouldn't be too hard. You're, ju you're basically just drawing circles on exactly the position that your data tells you. But I think this is, a, this is the better way to do it. I don't, have, I don't really have a perfect argument for why this is better in, in terms of this particular example because it's a very simple example. But when you come to bigger visualizations, the more, the more, visual, the more t stuff you add, the better it becomes to have named components that you can use multiple times with just different data. And now, sure, you could write functions for yourself that, uh, that reuse the same, the same code with different data and render different kinds of um, visualizations with just pure D3. And that would work, it's pretty cool. And it's, it's very similar to this, but the, the nice part here is that we're just declaratively saying we need circles, we need points, whatever. Um, and let me show you another cool thing. So you, you saw that the invaders are moving smoothly, right? They're animated. And there isn't actually much to that. It, I'm using the same trick I used for the, um, what's it called, for the, for the player you have every enemy is an object that has an ID, an X position, a width, a height. Uh, and the only reason they need a width and a height is because it made it easier to calculate collisions with bullets. Uh, and they have a speed and a vector for moving around. And then what happens is that, where is it? Uh, we have this function called advanced game state. And this is where all the, basically where all the magic happens for, no, don't try reading this code, there's too much. I'm just gonna show you the highlights. Um, advanced game state is called on every tick of the animation, which again happens through the dispatcher. There's a time, time interval of 16 milliseconds, 16 milliseconds because it gives you 60 frames per second. And those 16 milliseconds are enough to make a smooth, smooth looking animation. If you redraw something 60 times per second, a human eye will say, hey, this is a nice looking animation. It looks like movement. And you can see that down here, there's a time tick that just advances game state and then emits the change event. Uh, and to make the enemies animated, this is basically what we do. These two lines are the important part. You go through every enemy that is still alive and just change their X and Y position. Simple as that, it's just, some addition and you multiply by speed so you can make them f slower or faster if you want to. Um, then there's like collision detection with bullets and a random function that decides whether the enemy should shoot right now or not. And the principle for all of that is the same. If you, when you're adding a bullet either for the enemy or for your player, you just say, I need a new bullet at this location and the store adds it to the list of all bullets, and then on every loop of the animation, it just updates the X and Y positions of every bullet. Simple as that. When the bullet hits an edge, it stops existing. And that's pretty much all there, I there is to it. You can just, the point I'm trying to make is that you don't have to be super fancy about player interaction or user interaction. You can just change X and Y positions and let React's super fancy diffing algorithm take care of the rest. It will be okay, I promise. Um, I think I had, an, ah. Now there's another cool thing I can show you. So remember in Brett Victor's talk, he could dynamically move stuff to make changes into in a running game. Let me try showing that. Mm, I think the easiest would be, let's say, with the enemies. So we start the game, and you can see the game is running. Now I have to do this before I die which is going to be hard. Um, and if I do this and save, the enemies change, and then I die. Um, let's try just making the enemies less trigger happy. 
I, there's just like a list of constants that we change to let's say 20 shots per minute is gonna be fine. And now if we go, okay, let's, let's try making the bullets fast. I really, let's, let's make them not shoot at all. <laughs> um, yeah, so see, this is the easing I was talking about. You can, if you hold the arrow keys down, the player accelerates, and that was a really failed experiment because it's very hard to play this way. And as it turns out, for some reason, you can't move and shoot at the same time if you do that. If you move it with your mouse, you can. You can just go, I killed myself. Um, well, right, I was showing you, let's try changing the bullet speed, where is it? So we go into the store, and you see we can shoot and the bullets are accelerating. Um, and we can just make them not accelerate. Okay, if, apparently if you reload, if you change the store, the whole game needs to reload. But see, now the now this bullets behave differently. They don't accelerate. We can make them super fast. And now you can't really see them. They just jump off the screen into, into ticks. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is we have this thing called hot reloading that you get with React. Um, there's a bunch of boilerplate code you can use straight from GitHub. And the idea is that you're you can make changes in the game or in your data visualization without actually reloading, without changing anything. Mm. Let's, where's the player? Right. Let's say we want to be fat, wider. See, the player just changes. And you can dynamically do this every time you change a component. It's just going to re-render and maintain the same, the same data state that you already had in your um, visualization, which, is, which makes it a lot easier to develop these things. Because who here has built a data visualization where you spend most of your time, like it's slightly animated or it's got some player, some user interaction, and every time you want to use, you want to change something, you have to change the code, refresh the page, then interact with the whole visualization to get to the point that you are actually testing and look at it. It's a pain in the ass. So with this stuff, you don't have to do that. You can just change it and see it immediately on the screen. Now, of course, if you change something that's very core to your application like I did with the, with the data store, it's gonna refresh the whole page. But again, it refreshes the whole page automatically and you can just look at everything on the same screen. Um, now, I, I think that was pretty much everything I wanted to show you with this particular example. I have built several other examples that you can look at there on GitHub, um, but I feel like I have to make a tying up point. Why? why you should think about visualizations as games. All right. So basically what I wanted to show you today is that most visualizations that you, that you make on the web today, at least the ones you actually want to build because they're fun and awesome, they are pretty much the same as video games. The, it's a graphical interface that renders a bunch of different stuff and it, it interacts with the user and has to deal with a lot of changes and stuff like that. So it's pretty much the same as a video game, except it's a data visualization and it sounds boring if you're not making something fun. Um, now, that's everything I had to say about that. I could show you many other examples. I once built a visualization without React where that had something like 50,000 different animated SVG elements, uh, and it was consuming so much memory that I had to pre-calculate all the future positions of every, uh, every element on the page because otherwise it just crashed. Like, D3's enter, exit, update, whatever, just crashed my browser. I think I even managed to do it once so that it crashed my whole computer from Chrome. Um, 
because it's like 16 gigs of RAM wasn't enough. Uh, so what I had to do there was build, basically make keyframes, calculate them in advance, and then just make it a function of time that does the things. But I didn't have React, and it was a huge pain in the ass and took like a thousand lines of code. Um, now, another thing is you can go to swizzes.com slash html5 devconf. You'll get uh, the slides from the talk, six links to six different examples, and a huge discount for my React plus D3JS book that talks more about using React and D3JS together. And questions? Yeah. Um, the question was, is there anything in particular that you need from React that you don't get from Angular or something else? And kinda no. Uh, you could use D3 with Angular or with Backbone or with, what, what, or with whatever. Uh, the, main, the key is that you should start using D3 just for the calculations, for the mathematics, and less for uh, the actual manipulation of SVG. Be um, because whatever other framework you're using is probably very possessive about that. I know that React, for instance, if you change a component that it didn't expect changing, it's gonna flip out and throw errors and become very upset with you. Um, the one thing that React does have is when you're making dynamic visualizations, I feel that it does a better job than Angular because of the diffing algorithms. Um, and in my experience, now this just could just be because of the projects I was working on, Angular isn't as flexible when it comes to moving components around. Um, at least with Angular 1.3 or whatever it was, you lock yourself into this component hierarchy with the, with the scoping and, and all the other things, and then when you try to move a component from like the bottom right of your page to the top left of your page, if it's nested somewhere, you're gonna have to pretty much rewrite your whole app. Um, at least that's in, that was in my experience. Now, if you use Flux, if you don't use Flux, you kind of get into that same problem with React, but it's more well-defined because components aren't relying on their state. Uh, not on their state, but they don't care about where they are in the architecture. They just care about the properties they get, and then they render the right thing, which makes them a lot easier to move around and makes everything uh, more flexible. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay, more questions? Yes. Okay, so if you use the force layout for D3, how can you put something like that together with React? Uh, the cool part about that is I mentioned it briefly, D3 layouts don't actually render anything. They only calculate your positions and uh, stuff like that. So what you can do is just use the force layout, calculate the data, and then just throw the data as properties into React components and just let React deal with rendering it. Um, if you have something like access or uh, behaviors or stuff like that that does actually need access to the DOM, that I put that kind of that stuff into did component mount, component did mount and component did update and things like that, where basically you hook into React's lifecycle after something has been rendered, and that gives you access to the DOM to the DOM nodes. Uh, I just would recommend against trying to change too many things in there. Um, one one trick I use for access in particular is instead of is just have uh, like a div render with, or a G element in SVG render with React, and then just use D3 to throw stuff into it afterwards. Uh, it's not very elegant, and it loses a lot of the benefits of React, but it does help in some cases. But when it comes to basic layouts, you can just use them to generate the data, and then use React to render. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, let's see. Now, I have only r very recently started using 
flux, so my old visualizations weren't extremely reusable. But uh, for instance, here's one. Now this is a project I built for a, for a client, and it's a visualization of job applicants. You you can pick uh, who like the job, and then you get this thing. Um, now, it doesn't look like much, but it's basically using D3 to, ha to have zoom. And it's kind of slow because there are a lot of elements on the page. And the main reason I used React here is for all the interactivity between, um, oh, it doesn't work anymore. It used to work, okay. So you can, you can drag the line, and what they wanted was to be able to just drag the line to some point mm -hmm get um, and say everybody who is above a score 80 by some measure, by some rubric gets a pass and we interview them. Uh, the reusability part here was, for instance, these tooltips are just a component that renders in many different places. And it's the same component every time, just with different data. Uh, now, don't worry, all this data is random and anonymous. I wouldn't show you actual client data. Um, and that was kind of reusable, but honestly, I never had a chance again to use this exact implementation somewhere else. Perhaps a better example would be something like this, which was my first React visualization. And this shows, uh, this was seen by a few, probably like 20,000 people got on Hacker News, but it shows the a histogram of salaries for people with visas in the tech industry around here. Um, and the cool thing here is you should, you should never call yourself developers, by the way. See, um, the average salary for a developer is $74,000. For a programmer, it's 61000 and for an engineer, it's 86,000. <laughs> and they all have the same job, by the way. Um, and of course, you want to be in Menlo Park where Facebook exists. <laughs> um, but this is a histogram, so it would, it's generally more reusable. Um, and ideally, uh, I was being fancy and I made made it go back too far. Anyway, um, <coughs> now there's metadata. Basically, you have a histogram component that you, can, that you could essentially use anytime you want to build a, histo build a bar chart. Um, it just takes some data and renders a histogram, and you can put it, where is it? Essentially, yeah, that's, that would be more reusable, I guess. Did that answer your question? Okay, any more questions? Cool, that's it.